and, and happy Travel Talk Tuesday. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're gonna begin in a few minutes. We're just waiting for everyone to get long situated. In the meantime, feel free to write in the chat box where you're tuning in from. Uh, and hello and to everyone joining us on Facebook as well. So if you're on Facebook, please feel free to let us know where you're joining in from in uh, the comment section. All right, we have Barb from Canada. Hello, Barb. Lisa, North Carolina. It's Anthony from San Francisco. Wow, we have people all over. We have Virginia, Colorado. Mary Gail from Ottawa. Okay, everyone's joining in here. Kansas City. Oh, we have Kansas City and LA. Not good for the Super Bowl. All right, we'll give everyone just a couple more minutes here. A lot of people from Canada, that's great. We have New York, Tucson. Okay. All right, everyone. Give it a couple more minutes. Simon from Edmonton. Margaret from Washington. Oh, Anthony has a friend uh, who's from Antalya. Excellent. Phoenix, Texas. Good evening from the Netherlands. Oh, great. And we have someone from Hungary. Perfect. Big audience today. All right, let's get the show on the road, shall we? My name is Andrea uh, and I work out of the EF Go Ahead Tours Boston office. I'm so excited to be joined by all of you today for this wonderful travel talk on Turkey. If this is your first time joining us for a travel talk, welcome, we're happy to have you. And if you've joined us in the past, welcome back. Thank you for your continued support. Today's gonna to be a lot of fun, uh, but before we get started, I do just wanna set some expectations for this session. Firstly, that this is a webinar. So that means you will only be able to see and hear me, your host, as well as our special guest today. Your camera and audio will be off. So we won't actually be able to see or hear you, but we definitely wanna hear from you. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you're on Zoom. Or if you're joining in from Facebook, feel free to write your questions in the comment section there. We're gonna have a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation to answer as many questions as we can. And we also got several pre-submitted questions, um, which we've sort of worked into this presentation as well. We'll be answering them um, sort of along the way as we go. So over the next hour, we're going to virtually be traveling from the city of Istanbul to the ruins of Ephesus, to the bright white terraces of Pamukkale. We're gonna visit coastal Antalya. We're gonna go through the moon-like landscape of Cappadocia. And all the while, we're gonna be joined by our expert tour director, Mehmet, who I actually had the privilege of traveling with on Go Ahead's Grand Tour of Turkey this past October. He's gonna share his insider travel tips, his favorite must-see sites, as well as some of the best food and drink you should try while visiting the country. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our host for today, Mehmet, coming live from his home in Turkey. Mehmet, thank you so much for being here today. I know it's getting late into the evening for you, so we really appreciate it. We're so excited to have you take us on this virtual journey. Um, so before we get started, would you mind sharing a few words about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Mehmet, a native of Turkey, and I've been in the tourism of Turkey for more than 30 years now, uh, doing professional tour directing and uh, close to three decades with Go Ahead and EF Tours as well. And uh, I'll be here your host, your tour director, your direction finder, and I'll always be accessible to you as long as you're in Turkey. I'll be at the other end of the line or in the hotels. So. 
will spend a great 15 or if you booked the longer trip, 17 days in Turkey, hopefully when you show up here on this soil. Hi. Thank you so much, Mehmet. Now, before we start to actually go through Go Ahead's itinerary, I wanna start by talking a little bit about where Turkey is located. So the country's in a very unique position. It's lying partly in Asia, partly in Europe. It's surrounded on three sides by the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Aegean Sea. And it's a super multicultural destination. There's a ton of diverse cultures, history, geography, gastronomy, Mehmet, what can you tell us a little bit um, about Turkey and its geological features? Turkey is lived extremely unique in many ways because it's uh, one country that has for ages always been considered a country sitting on two continents. Well, the very center of this story is actually Istanbul, which is where the story, where the tour starts because Istanbul is literally one city sitting with one leg on one continent and then one leg on the other continent. We will be, most of the, most of the time we'll be on the European side, but definitely go across the water to the Asian as well. And so it's a city on two continents. It's a country on two continents and we will have our fair share of both continents on this tour. We will start from Europe and then we'll dive into the Asian half of Turkey and then finish back in Europe again. It's a country surrounded with waters all around. It's, it's a country like a peninsula shaped, geographically speaking. And this, just to give you a size, a sense of the size of the country, the land mass, I can compare it to Texas. If you're familiar with the size of Texas on the US map, Turkey is the size of Texas, except a little more elongated. But in terms of its geography and what we see of this geography, it will, dramatically change almost every single day we drive around Turkey because one day we'll be looking at beautiful Mediterranean hills and villages and two days from then we'll be in the desert-like country which is beautiful with its rock and volcanic formations and then we'll find ourselves on coasts that look like Riviera and then we'll be in Istanbul. All these areas almost every two days Guys, it'll feel like you have traveled to a new country yet again. That's how diverse Turkey is. Absolutely. I felt like every time we changed cities or locations, it truly felt like we were on a different planet, let alone country, let alone city. So Turkey was one of the most diverse places I've ever been in my life. So today we're going to talk about Go Ahead's grand tour of Turkey. Um, I'm super excited to be on this virtual journey all together. Right before we jump into the itinerary logistics, though, um, we have our first pre-submitted question, which is from Mario. So Mario was wondering, will this tour allow solo travelers? Uh, and I can actually take that question. So yes, you can travel solo on this tour. You can travel solo on any go-ahead itinerary, actually. We have our solo tour portfolio, which is made up of tours exclusively for solo travelers, but we can accommodate solo travelers on any of our 180 plus itineraries. Uh, I myself traveled solo on this itinerary um, and I was very lucky to have Mehmet as my tour director and I joined a really great group. For me, it was an amazing way to meet new people without having to compromise on what I wanted to do with my free afternoons and evenings. Uh, you still have total flexibility and freedom to really do what you want and make sure that you're maximizing your own interests but you still have the support of the group um, and all of the main logistics taken care of. So that was a huge plus for me personally, which leads me into the grand tour of Turkey itinerary. Uh, so the upper left uh, picture there is just sort of a loose map of what we're gonna follow. We're gonna get into the details as we go through the presentation, um, but it's a 15 day tour or as Mehmet mentioned, if you do want to extend your time in Istanbul, there is an opportunity to do a 17 day version as well. I highly recommend it. It's a super comprehensive itinerary. So we start in Istanbul, you make your way down south along the coast, you're gonna cross over the tourist mountains, and then you actually return back to Istanbul, which helps maximize flight opportunities to return home. So some highlights include coastal Antalya, you'll walk through the scenic old town, you're gonna see the stunningly beautiful mineral rich thermal waters of Pamukkale, and you're gonna visit the one of a kind rock formations in Cappadocia. If you're anything like me, you may spend all 15 to 17 days learning how to pronounce half of these cities and sites, um, but lucky for us, Mehmet is a great teacher 
Um, and I walked away with a lot of knowledge I didn't have before joining this trip. Now, as I mentioned, the tour starts in Istanbul. So Mehmet, what can you tell us about what we can expect to see and do here? What are the top sites of the city? Istanbul is one bustling metropolitan city that is like no other. Uh, there are, you know, there are places on earth that you can't duplicate the experience. I won't give names now. I mean, you've, I'm sure you've all had your own experiences with that. Like there's one place that's like no other in some way or in many ways. Istanbul is that one of those places. It's a city that's been sitting there close to 3,000 years at this point, layered like the cake and cream layers of a birthday cake. And each layer will offer you a different era in the history. And one of the most precious architectural and historic monuments of the city is, for example, Hagia Sophia, which is probably one of the most famous buildings from all of Turkey. And Hagia Sophia is 1,500 years old, folks. And it's been standing here 1,500 years and it's a monument that is significant in many ways. But let me tell you this, at the time when Hagia Sophia was built in Istanbul with its grandeur, there was no monumental cathedrals or churches anywhere in the world, including Europe. They were thousand years away. So Hagia Sophia is thousand years before its competitors that came later in Europe. Here's a picture from the interior of Hagia Sophia. And what makes this city unique in another way is it's a place of transition from culture to culture, pagan to Christian to Muslim. So when you walk into the Hagia Sophia, which is the legendary earliest monumental church of the entire world, you see Islamic calligraphy in the walls. You see the round disks, that's it. So when you walk into Hagia Sophia, you see more than just Christian history. You see Christian, Muslim, and even pagan. And details are in the corners that I will of course have to explain when we get there. And one other thing that's unique to Istanbul, there are underground structures and water re reservoirs in different parts of the world, but nothing as sophisticated as the ones in Istanbul. There are literally one every two thirds of a mile from each other. And these are underground cisterns. And we see this the first touring day at Istanbul that were filled up all the way to their ceilings with fresh water coming from mountain springs. This particular one, just to give you a size, a sense of the size is 500 feet wide and 200 feet deep. So we are gonna to tour this building and explain the story, how they filled it up, how they took the water from here. And what other strange stories took place in these underground cisterns? Like one of the earliest James Bond movies was filmed in this very cistern. Again, you have to come to hear the rest of the story. <laughs> All right, here is Aya Sophia on the left-hand side again. And the Ottoman Muslim era tried to proving, trying to prove its legacy and tried to build as fascinating as the Christians did. They built the blue mosque right across from it. Look at this, these two grand monuments are face to face and the area right by them with those pillars sticking up. This is the Hippodrome, which is one of the earliest and one of the best preserved uh, Roman horse chariot race arenas like in the movie Ben-Hur. So these are images from Istanbul and the Blue Mosque. So when you can find yourself a position on the terraces across from the Blue Mosque, this is what you see. Blue Mosque is perched on top of a hill with Asia in the back. So the high rises and the hills in the back are Asia and the water between the two is the Bosphorus. And here's a picture from the inside of IS of, uh, excuse me, sorry, Blue Mosque. It's very blue inside, hence the name Blue Mosque. Mehmet, we actually have a quick question here from Mari. Um, she's wondering what the preferred currency is in Turkey. Is it the lira, euro, US dollars, or can you sort of use a combo? Good question. We use lira, Turkish lira, which is around 13 plus liras to a US dollar now. But the great thing is, uh, Turkey is one of the most tourist friendly places on earth. I'll tell you this, you come with euros in your pocket, Nobody will say no. You come with dollars in your pocket, nobody will say no. You give your Turkish lira, no problem. Gold teeth, used shoes, they take anything. Well, kidding, of course. But anyway, uh, dollars and euros, any currency, pretty much any international currency is acceptable. Credit cards, you can use the credit cards 99% of the establishments. So it'll be a piece of cake. It's very easy to, to shop around Turkey. 
Amazing, thank you. Now, this is the Topaki Palace, right? Um, this tell us the Top Couple our... Palace, yes, right, sorry. This is the Top Couple Palace, which is one of our uh, sightseeing stops in this first touring day of Istanbul. And there are courts filled with exhibits, the costumes of the Ottoman sultans and their wives and their children, the treasury rooms, and there are interiors that will look exactly like this. This is one grand ballroom from the harem where the wives of the Ottoman Sultan and their children were living. And they used to throw banquets and, and parties in here. And uh, this will take at least two plus hours to tour through. And I will be lecturing and explaining, of course, we'll be always giving due free times so that you can explore at your own pace as well. The top couple palace. I remember touring this with our group. It was incredibly impressive. Um, oh, we have one more question here from Mark. Um, Mark is wondering, has strong security come back to this part of your country? What are your thoughts on that, Mehmet? Okay. Uh, this is one little episode I'll tell you, and I won't elaborate on top of it. In the 30, almost 32 years of my tour directing in Turkey, the only security incident that happened to me or to my groups is one single time of a bag snatching which happened in a bustling market area of Istanbul and through my network it's, I, I'm not so special Turkish people are amazing I went to a few shopkeepers I told them what happened they found the guys they brought the bag to us and there was his passport and some money in it and the funny part of it my client tipped the guy who stole the bag from earlier so it was a happy ended story but in 31 years only one incident so turkey is safe has always been safe but generally speaking i get the question yes it's a very safe place to travel i agree i felt really safe there as well we have one other question uh which is from sharon and she is wondering do we actually get to go into the mosques um and what sort of expectations should be set in order to be able to enter the mosques uh, yes, we're actually going into mosques. While in Istanbul, we'll be seeing two mosques. The rest of the tour outside of Istanbul, we'll, we're seeing at least one more mosque. The only expectation uh, when you're visiting a mosque is a dress code. So ladies will have to put on some kind of headscarf. So you have, if you have your own scarf with you, that's, that'll do it. And uh, long pants is another requirement. That's it. Or long skirts. And the only other thing is we take shoes off and they give us plastic bags and we carry our shoes in our bags through the, the tour through the mosque, 15, 20 minutes, half hour, and then back to normal again. Yeah, I remember we had about half our group who had who had packed scarves or you know some sort of shawl. Um, and then we had about half the group that used this to um, be a shopping opportunity. I was sort of on that latter half, but either way, you can't go wrong. There are absolutely beautiful textiles all throughout Turkey that even if you did bring one, it's probably worth investing in a couple extras and you can use that as an excuse. Now, once we leave Istanbul, uh, the next region of Turkey that we visit is Çanakkale. Uh, that took me a few rounds to practice to get that pronunciation right. I remember this region being super scenic um, and it was actually a little mini ferry ride that we took after riding the bus um, to get outside of Istanbul. So Mehmet, can you share just a little bit about what to expect during and then upon arrival um, after that ferry transfer? We drive out of Istanbul at approximately four and a half hours and we stop on the waters of another continent dividing water, a legendary water where from Alexander the Great to Persian Emperor Darius, from Hadrian to Trajan, every great emperor went across with their armies. We stop here for an amazing lunch experience. After tasting some of the local vegetables and fish and seafood, we take this ferry to the Asian side. After almost three days on the European side, now we're in Asia. And the first thing we do here is one ancient site that has probably inspired more art than any other story in the Western civilizations, history of art, literature or painting or sculpture, Troy. The story of Troy, the story of Helen and Paris and the king of Troy and his two sons. And this, the horse actually, well, of course the horse wouldn't survive the last 5,000 years, but 
the Hollywood Film Company was generous enough to send us this beautiful horse that was used in the movie. Uh, this is one of the two horses, but the the other horse, the other wooden horse is right outside of the rooms of Troy. So we will see at least one of them when we get there. Now that reminds me, when we were there, we spent about hour and a half, two hours at the ancient site of Troy. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, you had given us sort of a orientation guided walk and then people had plenty of time to take pictures. I, I always, in every archeological site, I do my part. I explain the stories and lecture. And when it is time to give some photo op in one place that we're back to, I always allow, you remember that, five or 10 minutes photo op ladies, gentlemen, we're meeting here and continue again. And in the end, like I did in Troy, I typically will say anybody wants to go back to the ruins, we have half hour or you can shop or eat ice cream here. So there's plenty of free time to explore at your own pace too. Great, thank you so much. So yeah, after one night in that hard to pronounce town, what was it, Andrea? The uh, Chanakale. 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 Got the, the CH poor. is what I always get stuck on. You, you don't sound American <laughs> anymore. You're sounding more and more Turkish. Chanakale. After one night in Chanakale, we hit the coast to go down to the Ephesus region. And on the way, we are seeing some beautiful mountain scenery, uh, seedy, quaint little villages and cobblestone streets. We will go and go up into these mountain villages and we'll get to taste their foods. And from this day on, we're in olive, olive oil country. Turkey, little is known about it, but Turkey is one of the greatest olive oil producers, both in quantity and quality. So for example, today is the day we'll be tasting Turkish olive oils in these villages. And we'll be sampling local food in the gardens of people, in their homes, tasting ice cream in the streets. This is one village we're visiting that day after Chanakkale called Adatepe. Yes. I remember this day was absolutely incredible. Um, so fun fact, this trip to Turkey was actually my first trip um, internationally since the start of the pandemic. So it was super special to me, super important. So I remember I actually posted my first photo in Turkey from this village. Um, and I had what I thought was a funny travel pun. I said, I'm never quitting travel, cold turkey again. Feel free to steal that or think it's cheesy. Um, but I will always remember sort of standing in front of this beautiful village and taking that photo. Now, the next stop on this itinerary is the Ephesus region. Uh, Mehmet, what can you tell us about this historic region? Turkey definitely has more than its fair share of well-preserved Roman ruins. Uh, I always say that it's not fair. I mean, Turkey has so much of it, it's not fair. It's almost too many of them. But Ephesus is definitely a one special place among all the other ruins and archaeological sites in Turkey. It's very well preserved. And it is considered, was considered back in its time, and historians today agree with it, one of the top three Roman metropolitan centers of the ancient world after Rome, Alexandria, Egypt, and here is Ephesus. We'll be touring through the walking through the streets of Ephesus. We'll be seeing hard to believe in beauty, majestic structures like the Celsus Library in the background, this picture right here. And as I did explain already, after having given lectures, I will allow you guys to walk into these libraries, to these buildings. We'll go into the theaters. This is a theater that ranks in the top two, three theaters. And I think if I am not exaggerating it, it is not number three, it's number two. After the Colosseum of Rome, 25,000 capacity from Pavarotti to Ray Charles, uh, from Sting to Queen, everybody came and performed in here in the old days. Nowadays, they only allow classical music, but we'll get in here and we will hear all these great stories that took place inside this theater, including the story of St. Paul, who almost got himself killed in this very theater. Mehmet, really quick, we're getting a few questions um, okay. just in terms of what sites are open and are there any restrictions um, directly related to the pandemic? Um, can you speak on that in terms of what travel is like, you know, right now or, you know, in the immediate future, how you sort of predict it will be? Well, of course, it's hard to 
know what's going to happen the next month in this modern world now, after the pandemic especially. But currently in Turkey, uh, there are no restrictions. There are regulations. Uh, you can go into museums. You can go into uh, indoor places. Uh, but you're always supposed to be wearing masks. And of course, keep the social distance. That's about it. Restrictions only apply if there is a physical logistical reason to it. But other than that, this pandemic doesn't really deter us from doing what we used to do for 30 years. We're still seeing everything. I remember with our group, it's nice. I mean, you're seeing all these pictures, all these ancient ruins, so much is outside and they're so large that you have a lot of space, you're not super crowded um, and the weather is perfect. So um, for as much time as you are spending inside, um, you know, it's very little compared to all the time you're actually spending outside. So um, I know that our group really didn't feel restricted in any way with any of the COVID protocols or anything like that. I, I will tell you this, I did this, the tours last year also, which was when the restrictions were at its highest. And Dania, Andrea, you were there too. Mm -hmm. as, as she said, indoor museums were the only indoor places we had to tour. Masks, that was it. And you don't miss anything. We see pretty much everything. We just keep the distance. That's about it. Yes, and then here we are looking at the same day we're visiting the house of Mother Mary, because the legend has it that when Jesus was crucified, after he was crucified, St. John the disciple took Mary with him and they came to Ephesus. John organized the early Christian community in Ephesus. Mary lived up in the mountains and the ascension of Mary, according to this one legend, happened right here. So this is a place for pilgrims as well, the house of Mary up in the hills. And this is a picture from the interior of the house of Mary. All right. After so much of history and getting scholarly and the Roman and the Byzantine and Turkish histories, I think we have to lighten up a little bit. That's what we're doing tonight. We're going out to a fun Turkish restaurant, a traditional Turkish restaurant type called Mehane, which is all about sampling yummy seafood, vegetables coming in small portions to be shared on the table by group members. And then for anyone who wants to try the Turkish legendary alcoholic beverage, it's the raka, which is a very innocent looking, clear looking liquid when you add water. See the guy holding up this glass of white looking thing? That's raka from a chemical reaction of the anise in it. It turns to white and that's what we yeah. sip along with the, with the mazes. So this is one night we go out and sample the great seafood and fish and the vegetables of that area with the company of some raka or if you're not an alcohol drinking person, you can have a Turkish drink, which is not on this table, which is in every single restaurant called Ayran. I don't know, Andrea, if you remember this. Water diluted yogurt. And Turkish yogurt is some of the best in the world, believe me. Maybe a pinch of salt in it. So you can always order Ayran anywhere you go. Absolutely. I remember when our group did this excursion, um, it was really nice. Uh, it was a really nice evening, perfect weather, where we sort of sat out under the stars. The patio was all lit up. We practically had the place to ourselves, um, but there was some live local music. So as all these plates of food were being brought out to us, all the small plates and the mezes, and we were trying everything that they brought, it was so delicious. Um, but a lot of the group actually stood up and started dancing in between courses. And I think it took a lot of people out of their comfort zone, but it also felt fun and natural in the moment. So that was definitely one of my most memorable meals that we had together in Turkey then. All right, the next day we're leaving now slowly the Ephesus region to reach our next destination. But on the way, first thing in the morning, we're going up to the hills again, yet again, to see another one of those cute little Turkish villages called Shirinje. So, with its cobblestone streets and home courtyards filled with flowers and citrus trees, the spices sold in the streets, the olive oil pressed in their own home facilities that these ladies sell in the streets as well. But what this village is especially famous for is its wines, fruit wines. Fruit wines made from cranberry, from strawberry, peach, cherry, you name it. So we'll get a chance to sit in one of those wineries and sample their wines as part of our included activity that morning. And the best part is, after showing you all the good yummy Turkish dishes in every restaurant, I'll allow you guys some free time. 
to go in any family owned place and sit down for a quiet, romantic, local Turkish lunch. Shirinja. That's a pronunciation that I still haven't mastered. So thank God you're here to walk us through this, Mehmet. You have to come back. Absolutely. So at this point, we're about halfway through the itinerary if you're looking at, or if you're thinking of that map that we showed in the beginning. Um, so we're right, we're right around day seven and we're making our way towards Pamukkale to explore some of the area's natural wonders. Now, right before we jump into this, because I actually think it sort of ties in nicely, um, we had a few questions, Mehmet, about um, tap water and if it's safe to drink. Um, and then we also talked about that yogurt drink. So just sort of the quality of the dairy as well. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, we have, with every single included meal that you will be having along this tour in Turkey, breakfast or lunch or dinner, as long as it's included, we will have included bottled water on the table. Uh, in terms of tap water, this is the guideline I give to my people. I say I don't necessarily recommend drinking tap water because a Turk could get sick from American tap water in the United States because the germ content of every country's water is different. It may get you sick because of that. But if you're the kind of person I've been to Mexico and Indonesia and to, to Uruguay, I've been drinking this tap water everywhere. Nothing happens to me. Go for it. But typically I say, stick with the bottle water. Uh, there was a question with the dairy products. Oh, just, you know, you were talking about the yogurt drink. Um, so just yeah. sort of, you know, what else is the area known for? And sort of what's that, what, what are the dairy products like? You could survive on yogurt in Turkey. You know, Andrea, every morning, every breakfast, beside the different types of cheeses and five different kinds of olives and honeys and jams and fresh vegetables, you always have yogurt there, right? Absolutely. Just Cheese plain yogurt and everything and fresh. With, with cut up little fruits in it. So yogurt is one of the best foods in Turkey, actually. And a Turk, a typical Turk will eat at least a spoon or two of yogurt every day. Seriously, this is a yogurt country and dairy country. Spoon of yogurt a day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> now, speaking of you know health and wellness, let's talk about these mineral springs. All right. Okay. Well, Pamukkale is one unique place which is calcium bicarbonate formations that have crystallized. It's a hot spring where the water evaporates slowly and over the past 20,000 years, it's been leaving those crystallized natural formations. All these pools are natural formations, they're not man-made. So when we go there, we'll get a chance to soak our legs in it, not swim in it because there are regulations and laws to protect the formations. So we can't swim in them, but we'll be walking around taking pictures of it. But of course, this formation was here for tens of thousands of years. And Romans were there at least for 3000 years. Uh, so they took advantage of it and they built an ancient city right behind these formations. So when we get to Pamukkale, we don't just see a natural beauty. We see also a city of great quality, including this theater. And when you go up to the top seats, it's an it's hard to describe. It's you walk into the, 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 the auditorium from the very top until you walk right through a gate, you don't see anything. And all of a sudden, this is the picture that opens in front of your eyes. Remember that Andrea, we did that, right? You feel like you are completely back in time and yeah. there's just not a bad angle to take a photo. It's absolutely breathtaking. So, yeah, so it's two in one. It's a great natural wonder like no else in the world, and then a great antique city in one place. And after that one day and one night in Pamukkale, we've left Pamukkale and here we're in Antalya. You have anything about Antalya you wanna say? Absolutely, Antalya was one of my favorite cities that we visited, to be honest, and I had never heard of it before traveling to Turkey, before researching Turkey. I had no idea what to expect. Um, but it was absolutely stunning. I mean, just looking at this picture here, when we pull up on the bus, we stop at this viewpoint, we essentially see this picture. I think I have this picture somewhere on my camera roll where it's just pristine beaches, beautiful scenery. You can see all the mountains um, and the area offers still a lot of museums, a lot of history, much like the rest of the country as well. So I know it's known sort of as the Turkish Mediterranean. Mehmet, what can you tell us about this region? Uh, this is one of the top three tourist destinations in all of Turkey. 
This is one of the three areas that actually ignited the tourism back in 60s in Turkey, uh, because Antalya simply has anything and everything a tourist might look for. Pristine, clear, turquoise water beaches, mountains where you can go ski and, and hike and trek, great archaeology. Within just like half hour, you can reach all these three things, seriously. I'm not exaggerating. And one thing we're seeing in this city, the first thing we're seeing in the city when we arrive is this archaeological museum, a piece of gem, not overwhelming, like a, like a little temple of antique Kuri. You walk from room to room. Within literally one hour, you'll feel like you've gone through the entire Roman history, some great quality statuary and tombs from the cities that we will be visiting the next two days actually. So before we see the cities, we'll see the artifacts that come from there. So it's a good start, it's a good introduction. And after that museum, we walk into this ancient city called Antalya through a gate where the, some of the most famous Roman emperors had walked through and that emperor is Hadrian. And believe it or not, this gate was built to commemorate the visit of Hadrian to the city back in 129. Hence the name Hadrian's Gate. So the first person in the whole world that walked through this gate is the Emperor Hadrian himself. And we'll walk through the gate and then find ourselves in the streets, the cobblestone streets of Antalya. Andrea, I remember telling one of my fun stories and you got such a kick out of it. Uh, I'll, I'll let you talk about it then. But there yeah. is something that you found so amusing, so fun. What was it? These pictures, they bring it back, these winding narrow streets. So. I remember you were taking us on our guided tour. We had just gone through Hadrian's Gate um, and we were sort of looking around and looking, taking in all the architecture and you noted how all of the corners were rounded. None of the corners that we passed by or that you could see in, up in the distance um, were the traditional sharp corners that you would picture on a regular building. And you had explained to us that because it goes back way, way, way in time, where they actually rounded them down so that way when the camels went through the narrow passageways, they wouldn't get jabbed in the side. So it's this whole, you know, village region of people that are accommodating all their architecture towards camels. That's how important they were. Um, and I just, I never forgot that. And now every time I look in these photos, it just sticks out to me. So, all right. Yes, Antalya, Old Town. And then when we walk through the Antalya Old Town, we don't see just see precious two, 300 year old architecture, homes and beautiful gardens. We also see great views of the harbor. When you look at this picture, there's a round drum shaped building. That was a lighthouse marking the entrance to the harbor. Right behind, there's a gorgeous old harbor with yachts and, and boats. We also go right into it, walk through that harbor and the city is in the back, you can see. These are the views we're seeing during our walking tour of Old Antalya. And the mountains in the back are Taurus Mountains. If you ever came across this name, they are the most solid mountain range of Turkey. Yep, so this is, this is a picture from the next day, the following day. Uh, it's an optional tour actually, uh, a tour called Pargen Astandos, an optional tour excursion we've been running for almost 30 years with great success and great feedback from people. It's a city, it's two cities. One is Parge, the square shaped open space with columns surrounding it. It's literally some of the oldest shopping malls in the ancient world. It was a collection of shops with law and order, with price regulations, with a mall manager, a government employee who would keep things under control. Look all the way back in the, in the back part of the picture. There's a long structure stretched like an elliptical shape. That's the stadium of Parge. And right behind it in the upper left corner, there's a theater of Parge. And I think the next picture is gonna be, yes, a picture from the theater of Parge. And uh, I, I try to be popular. I try to be remembered on my tours. So I show off every now and then by performing something. Uh, last time with, was it? On your tour as well, Andrea, did, did I do anything in this theater? I don't remember. You absolutely did. We have the pictures and videos to prove it. You gave an absolutely spectacular performance that echoed throughout the theater that I know 
everyone in my group, myself included, walked away with chills. So your when, record deal is pending. Is it when I sang It's Now or Never? I Did think I so. I think that was it. You know, it might have been something by Madonna, Cher. I can't quite remember, <laughs> but I, th I think you're onto something there. I think it's now or never from Elvis. A song from Elvis in a Roman theater from a Turk. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah. And the next picture is Aspandos, which is one of the top best preserved theaters in the world. It's so well preserved, including the stage building in the back. Uh, that's where they change their costumes, the actors nowadays. Opera performers are changing their costumes in there because the Turkish Ministry of Culture is throwing a 10 day opera ballet festival in Antalya and companies from all around the world and come and perform here. It's one of the two places we see today, the day of Aspendos and Pergi. Amazing, thank you so much, Mehmet. Um, we have another pre-submitted question here from Joyce. And she's curious whether English is spoken in most places. And I know I can speak from my experience that everywhere we went on tour, it was very widely spoken uh, or at least understood where we were able to communicate. We didn't have any issues in shops or restaurants, um, but can you share any insight in terms of you know, how English is taught in Turkey and the importance of it? Well, Turkey is a tourist destination and Turkey's tourism has always been a major component of Turkish economy and revenues. So governments in Turkey in the last few decades have been putting great emphasis into language teaching from grade five, private or pri elementary schools, they start teaching a foreign language and that's literally always English people choose, kids choose. And uh, anyone under the age of 50 will speak at least basic English, but in tourist areas for sure, they'll speak your language, no worries about it. And they can even adjust their accent depending on where you come from in the United States. That's how pro they are. It's truly impressive. Um, and now we're at my favorite part of the tour. I'm not sure if you can tell with my background here, um, but Cappadocia. So we've made our way from Istanbul along the coast. We're now crossing the Taurus Mountains to get to Cappadocia. There's a few stops along the way that Mehmet's gonna get into. But this is where my group, at least, had the once in a lifetime opportunity to board a hot air balloon. We viewed Turkey from 3,000 feet in the air at sunrise. It was a bucket list item that I didn't know was on my bucket list until I got there. I 10 out of 10 recommend. Um, you know, of course, it's subject to weather um, and availability and things like that. But absolutely, you should make this a total priority and you should not leave Turkey without it. Um, Mehmet, just in case, you know, not everyone's a fan of heights, what else is the area known for? Can you talk a little bit about the history of the region as well? Cappadocia is one of the uh, global hubs of uh, Christian birth and uh, rise and, and cultural establishment. But the general central Turkey has always been a spiritual country for either the Christian or Jewish or Muslim cultures. So on the way to Cappadocia, we're stopping in the city of Konya, which is the home. I'm sure a lot of guys here with us tonight are familiar with the name of Rumi, who is the greatest, actually the top best-selling spiritual poet in our modern times now. A man from Turkey, Konya, were visiting his shrine. And the same dress code will apply, but it's very practical. All they want from you is just put a, a headdress, I mean, head cover, excuse me, ladies, that's it. So we'll be able to take pictures, buy the music of Rumi, buy books of Rumi in here, and then hit the road to go up to Cappadocia. Again, we are not visiting or seeing any whirling dervish ritual in here, but that's part of an optional excursion that's already happening the next day in Cappadocia. This is from the interior. The place has been so prestigious, so well-respected by Ottoman authority, the government, including uh, the Ottoman sultans, Literally every single item hanging on the walls, the calligraphy, the carpets, the writings, all of them are gifts from the Ottoman Sultans coming from Istanbul. So, yes, and this is the end of our journey from Antalya. What a climax. We're reaching Cappadocia tonight. And these are formations and homes that we will be seeing in Cappadocia. But the next morning when you wake up, you will have the option of either 
staying in your warm beds or sacrifice from your sleep, maybe some two hours and go on a hot air balloon that will remain unforgettable for the rest of your lives. I'm serious. Istanbul, sorry, Cappadocia hot air balloon experience has literally become a main attraction that's creating its own tourism. People are coming from some destinations, believe it or not, some countries, tourists are coming to Turkey to go on the hot air balloon in Cappadocia. So, and if you're too lazy to get out of your bed, you can go out to the terrace of your hotel and do the, the Instagram thing, and then you'll become popular with Instagram. <laughs> Never it's having done in the hot air balloon, you will be more popular. I think of our group, our group was what, 18, 19 people. I think there were only a couple people who didn't get up at 4.30 in the morning to do this hot air balloon ride. And it's because they live in Albuquerque. So they have the Albuquerque <laughs> hot air true. balloon festival in their backyard. So that was excusable. But we did have one question um, that I should have clarified, I apologize, is whether or not the hot air balloon is included through Go Ahead, um, and it is not. So it's completely optional. It's something um, you cannot pay for in advance. You pay for it upon arrival. Um, if you're um, interested in doing it, there's just a lot of factors. You can't predict the weather. You can't predict availability until you're actually there. Um, but it's something that your tour director, Mehmet, totally organized for us. Um, we had the company come right to the hotel. They picked us up. We paid them. You could use credit card or cash. Um, it was very easy. It's just not something you're able to sort of include as part of that larger tour price. I hope that helps. Yes. And the day we're spending in Cappadocia, uh, we can't go by without visiting and spending some lengthy time in the place called Göreme which is written in the lower left corner of this picture. Göreme is the first historic site that entered UNESCO's World Heritage List from Turkey back in 1960s. Actually, if there are two, three places that ushered in Turkey a new era, the era of tourism, Istanbul is one, Antalya, and definitely Göreme, because not only are you looking at and marveling and feeling fascinated by those rock cut homes and monasteries, in the next picture, I think we're going to see the interiors of the churches. Exactly. This is an art that went down in art history books and pick up any art history book on Christian iconography. There will be a section called Cappadocian art. This is rural art. This is very colorful, very lively art. Literally every single little rock carved church. Look at those details. Look at those arches and columns. It's not brick and mortar. It's rock cart that looks precisely like the churches in Europe or in Istanbul. And after enough time in Gorema, we'll be moving into a town called Abanos. We'll visit one of the family workshops there out of many, and we'll see them in action. Make a beautiful Turkish teapot or maybe a flower pot or maybe a vase or something in their own hands. And this is also a place where you can buy really traditional souvenirs which is applicable to any other shopping in Turkey. Practically anything you can buy can be shipped to the United States or Canada, depending on where you come from. So you don't really have to worry about carrying them on you unless you want to. It was incredibly convenient. I know a lot of our group, they bought, you know, there was one woman, she bought an entire tea set. There was another woman, those massive, massive, um, you know, serving dishes, bowls, you can use them as a serving dish or you can hang them on the wall. Not very easy to carry home, especially in a carry-on or a checked bag. Um, so the ability to ship them with tracking and everything, it was extremely convenient for our group. All right, this is a nice scene from Cappadocia. And actually this is our last night in Cappadocia also. Extremely sad. Now, this is a question we've seen quite a few times at the start of the presentation. We sort of put it off just because we knew it was gonna come up later on. Um, but we have very many people wondering, Mehmet, in your opinion, what is the best time of year weather-wise to visit Turkey? Okay, well, in terms of uh, avoiding big tourist crowds, uh, I will say second half of March into April is the best quietest time of the year. All right. I'm moving into the other half of the year. Again, the quietest times of the year in the fall to winter season is going to be late October into early November. But other than that, in terms of weather compatibility, anytime between 
uh, end of March, April, May, even early March is fine because I think that's one of the questions we received tonight. How is the weather in March? One potential future visitor was asking. Uh, the temperatures will never go below 50 degrees daytime and it will go up to in Antalya, for example, 65, who knows, even, even seven. But generally speaking, uh, April, May, and then second half of September, because it's a little cooler, October into early November are the best times of the year to visit. And it really depends where you are as well. I mean, we were there yeah. mid-October and you know it was perfectly comfortable, light sweater in Istanbul. And then there were people in bathing suits swimming on the beach in Antalya. And then at 4.30 in the morning up in the mountains of Cappadocia, everyone had on mittens and jackets because it was a little chilly until the sun came out. So you sort of get a wide spectrum. Um, I would definitely recommend packing multiple layers, more excuses to buy more of those scarves um, or any sort of textiles like that. But um, any of those shoulder seasons that Mehmet offered will really offer uh, the most pleasant and I would say the most temperate variety of all those. And we did have one other question come through, um, which was in terms of the cost of the hot air balloon. Um, so this does depend um, seasonality and things like that, but it's roughly right around 200 euro. Um, so, you know, take into currency, you know, whether you pay in US, Canadian, Turkish Lira, um, but I'd say right around 200 is sort of that ballpark that you can expect. Great, so now we've sort of made our loop going uh, from Istanbul southwest and then sort of back up into the mountains. And at the end of the tour, we are actually going to return back to Istanbul, um, which is an enormous city. I know we touched on it has so many different sites, so many different neighborhoods to explore. I myself was super excited to actually return because I felt like we sort of got the lay of the land those first two days. Um, and I was super excited to have those additional two days to just feel a little bit more confident exploring on my own. So Mehmet, what can the group expect to do on the last two days of the tour versus the first two days in Istanbul? Well, the first two days in Istanbul, we saw the highlights that every tourist has to come and see, but now we've covered the ground so we can go off the beaten track. This is what's wonderful about the last day or last two days in Istanbul. We'll go off the beaten track and we'll go to areas where you'll see only a few tourists because everyone is busy visiting mosques and churches. Uh, we're going the other way. We're crossing this body of water, the legendary Bosphorus, the, the continental division between Europe and Asia. We'll go from Europe on the left side of our picture here to Asia and we'll dive into an area which will be one uh, mesmerizing experience, the smells, the colors, the fish and seafood stands, the, the street food. Uh, so it will be a almost like a street food tour. I say almost because I will try to limit our street food sampling to an amount so that it doesn't deviate us or get us too full for a lunch because I'm, we're gonna be going to a restaurant that's it's probably- quite a lunch top three restaurants in all of Turkey and top number one in Istanbul, I think. But these are the views that we'll be seeing in the market. And then this is the view we'll have in front of us when we sit down for lunch. And, and it will be our uh, lunch made up of mazes. And ask me, if anyone will ask me right now, right here, tell us some traditional dishes we'll be eating that day. I'll answer it like this. I have no idea because Believe me, even if you're a meat lover, you will be offered a different kind of meat in April versus when you're coming and visiting in September because this restaurant takes pride in only selecting the best in the best time of the year. So there's no standard menu. So you'll only remember it for the rest of your life. That's all I will say. As you, you can see, I'm very enthusiastic <laughs> about it. Anyway, after that wonderful food market and lunch, feastly lunch stop, we're riding back across the Bosphorus again to the Grand Bazaar. One of the greatest things, one of the most uh, uh, convenient things about our hotel in Istanbul, it's situated 10, 15 minutes walking from Hagia Sophia, Blue Mosque, the Grand Palace, the Hippodrome Squares, and only five minutes from the Grand Bazaar. 
It's dangerous for you guys, but good for the Turkish economy because the last place we're going today before the end of the tour is the Grand Bazaar. Uh, don't worry, I won't be just carrying you behind me with a rope that you're holding on. I'll just show you around the Grand Bazaar, give you your directions as to how to get in and out, and then I'll say, free time. You can spend two hours to six hours a year because the hotel is right around the corner from here. The greatest and the biggest shopping mall in the world. You can comfortably say this to your friends when you go back to, to your homes because A, what is it? 400, 4,800 4, shops in the total complex. It's overwhelming in the best way possible. Um, but I can't recommend it enough. And it's especially nice when you have a local like Mehmet sort of orienting you before you're in there on your own. Now, I know we only have a few minutes left, but as promised, Mehmet does have um, some of his top recommendations for food and drink within Turkey. Um, so he's gonna go through and share those with you. And I just have to say up front, I echo all of these recommendations. All right, okay, uh, something you would be calling in the United States or in Canada, maybe uh, gyro, gyros, or shawarma in the Israeli fashion. You can find chicken or beef versions of this, spiced up, seasoned, a lot of greens and pickled vegetables. If you want onion, french fries, everything wrapped inside these uh, pita breads. That's one of my favorites, one of the yummiest street food actually, which you don't even have to come and ask me, where do we find them? It's everywhere. It's literally everywhere. And another thing that's everywhere in every street corner is Turkish simit. The closest it comes to you, it comes to, for you, my friends, I would call it a bagel, except 16 times better tasting than bagel. Excuse me, I'll be a little patriotic here. Uh, it's sesame crusted outside, a softer inside, but salted, but not highly salted. Again, every street corner, there's a street vendor selling those simits. And hotel breakfast buffets also always feature simits. Pide, it's one of the top most popular foods in Turkey. Those pide restaurants are in every neighborhood. From vegetable only to vegetable and meat to cheese or combo three, four cheese pides. It's also one of my favorites. Fish and seafood. Okay, fish and seafood, Turkey literally sits on water. I mean, we will be in Istanbul, we'll be in Ephesus, we'll be in Antalya. All three major sites are on the water and there'll be ample chance of tasting some of the best fish and seafood, but especially in Istanbul. And we're definitely doing this when we go on the Bosphorus. And Burek, yes. These are final pastries. Uh, that come with spinach to egg, to, chi to, to uh, cheeses. And it's either wrapped like a wrap, rolled up, like on the right-hand side of the screen, or like on the left-hand side, it may come in layers and cooked in typically wood fire ovens. And it's to die for. And again, many hotel buffets will be featuring them on a daily basis. Absolutely delicious. Um, you know, every hotel you go in, they have the different buffet set up, but you have to try as many of them as you can. You won't be sorry, I promise. Now, we have another question here from Charles um, on the topic of food. He's wondering, where is the best street food for lamb? What do you recommend, Mehmet? Where is the best street food for lamb? Actually, uh, Istanbul, I will say Istanbul. Istanbul has the greatest street food actually because it's the most cosmopolitan and cities that live on the street, you always have the best street food. And Istanbul is a city that ever sleeps like New York City. So, but in Istanbul, we are both the day we go to this food market area. I will show you, I will get you to taste some. So you're tasting some of this. Also close to our hotel, there's another pedestrianized area, Istiklal Street. So you can find these two areas, the best street food land. Amazing recommendation. Thank you. Well, Mehmet, thank you so much for taking us on this incredible journey through Turkey. I've seen quite a few comments come through about how many people are booking a trip or adding it to their bucket list. We absolutely hope to see you on the grand tour of Turkey with Mehmet soon. 
Um, and I do know we're coming up on time here. So if you have to go, we will be sending out a recording of this. However, we do have a few more questions to answer um, that we're gonna go through now. So if you have the time, definitely feel free to stay on here. So starting off, it looks like one of the first questions we got is from Eve. Um, and she's wondering, are there any monuments undergoing renovations and or closed right now that people with upcoming trips should be aware of? There is only one monument currently undergoing a major restoration renovation. That's the Blue Mosque. But uh, it's, it won't stop us from getting into the Blue Mosque. There's nothing outside. Outside is completely visible and clear. The restoration is inside, but we still get a chance to go inside the Blue Mosque. And Unfortunately, because of the restoration, some of it is closed off, but we will make up for it like we did it on our tour with Andrea as well. I will take you guys when you come to Istanbul, if this restoration is still going on, and take you into my top number one mosque in Istanbul, which is the Mosque of Suleiman, which is like mind-blowing. It's actually, in my opinion, much more impressive than the Blue Mosque. Blue Mosque has a name, but we make up for it and overdose with the Moscow Suleiman, I can say that. Yeah, our group was really lucky. We got to see both um, and the Moscow Suleiman, it definitely was a little less crowded. I feel like it doesn't quite have that same name recognition. So it was good for us for sure. Um, the next sort of set of questions here, people are wondering about Turkish holidays, um, especially Ramadan. Um, so does Ramadan impact travel within Turkey or things being open no. and are there no, any everything other is, holidays? Every, everything is open. The country is so tourist driven uh, and tourist geared. That's reason number one. Reason number two, why it never impairs your travel capacity is because Turkey is majority Muslim, but a very moderate, very modern, very uh, industrious Muslim nation. So shops don't close, even restaurants don't close because there are always people who, who don't fast in the month of Ramadan. So. It's, it's no obstacle to us. We just do everything the way we do, even through the entire month of Ramadan. Amazing, thank you. Um, can you explain a little bit or go into detail a little bit about mobility, um, just in terms of how much walking is required? Are there a lot of steps? Um, you know, wh what would you say to someone who may have some mobility concerns, but is interested on, uh, on going on this itinerary? Okay, if I would rate it myself, my own Mehmet rating, one to five of difficulty, I would say Turkey would fit in three to four. Uh, not in Istanbul, but mm -hmm. in Cappadocia, in some ruins. Uh, even though I have to say, compared to 10 years ago, everything is a lot more accessible. The government has done a great job making them accessible, but still, I would say three to four. I would agree with that. You know, thinking back on the, what we did with all of the ruins, with all of the sites, I'd say, you know, you're probably doing at least two to three hours of walking a day, um, broken up periodically. But I'd say, you know, if you were to smush it all together, you're on your feet for quite some time. And some of those ruins don't necessarily have shade or benches. So it's just something to take into consideration if it is a concern of yours. Now, another question we got um, for, let's see here, from Gisela. She's wondering, is Turkey considered a secular country or an Islamic country? Can you tell us a little bit about the constitution of Turkey? Okay, well, uh, Turkey is a culturally speaking a Muslim country. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a secular country. And it's a country where Islamic law doesn't apply. Like women who want to cover up they do cover up. And then many other women don't cover up. Turkish Muslim ladies who consider themselves Muslim, they don't feel obliged to wear the, 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 the headscarf. So they don't. So there's no enforcing the Islamic system or Islamic culture. Same thing applies to alcohol, for example, in Islam is a taboo. taboo. But there are restaurants who don't serve alcohol. There are restaurants who openly serve alcohol. So it's a, it's a mixture, but it's a secular country. It's a secular country. Great, thank you so much. And then another question we got from Mari is about beach time. Um, so are there any chances within the itinerary to visit some of those gorgeous beaches along the coast during our tour? Precisely. We yes, yes. <laughs> actually the day we get to Çanakkale before Troy, it's a beautiful hotel sitting on a beach 
which is easy access from the hotel. And when we get down to Antalya, actually, uh, there is one day, one entire day that is free if you want to stay back in the hotel or take public transport to a nearby great beach. Or even if you decide to go on an optional excursion that is planned for the day, that excursion also plans a beautiful Turkish beach visit and swim time. So in either case, you get to swim in the Mediterranean. Amazing. Margaret is wondering, she has a couple questions about optional excursions. So her first question here is, are the whirling dervishes offered as an optional? Yes, it is offered as an optional. Uh, when we go through, after Antalya, when we go through central Turkey, we visit the shrine of Rumi. And when we get to Cappadocia that night, there is an optional excursion offered to see in Cappadocia, the whirling dervishes. So yes, it is part of our optional excursion list. Amazing. And then we also have an optional excursion to the Hammam Spa um, on that second part um, when we return back to Istanbul. Can you speak a little bit in terms of what is included in that Hammam Spa visit? What is included in that Hammam Spa is our visit is uh, hot steamy interiors, traditional architecture, because the bath goes back to 500 years ago. It's a bath that's been sitting there 500 years, believe it or not. A uh, lot of foam and foam massages. They literally coat you in a big giant bubble or foam, soapy foam, and then they rub your body. They scrub your skin from head to toe and exfoliate the entire body, actually. They give you a massage. They pamper you in there. They pamper you in every sense. It's approximately an hour and 15, 20 minutes a total off, and in the end, you're rejuvenated, feel so fresh. They take you out to a waiting lounge in the Roman Turkish bath, and they say, what would you like to be offered? Some Turkish tea or maybe an apple cider. So that's your relaxation time, and whenever you're ready, you get back in your clothes, and then you go back to our hotel. Amazing. Um, and it's nice that this sort of um, experience is offered towards the end of the tour, because I think after 15 days running around, you know, hiking all the ruins, being up in the hot air balloon, I think a spa treatment is well deserved. Um, and I know our group definitely appreciated having that opportunity as well. So the last two questions we're going to get through here are um, Alexandra is wondering which cities of the cities that we visit have the best tea and Turkish coffee? What is your local recommendation, Mehmet? Turkey's tea comes from the Black Sea coast, which we're not visiting, but in any decent restaurant or cafe, it's always fresh, good Turkish tea because Turks like their tea fresh. So the guy behind the tea counter will be replenishing his tea every half hour, 40 minutes. So it's always fresh, brewed black tea and Turkish coffee, the same. We have high standards for Turkish coffee, thick and frothy, and you can't go back without trying the Turkish coffee, of course. No, absolutely not. And the last question we have here is from Rachel. She's wondering, what time do the bazaars typically close? The bazaars typically close, uh, depending on the time of the year. It's all about when it's getting dark. But uh, in the month of April, for example, the Grand Bazaar near our hotel is open until 7 o'clock, 7.30. Like the day we come from the food market tour, we're arriving back in the hotel area and the bazaar area, let me say around 2 o'clock at the latest, 2.30 at the latest, and dinner is not until 7 o'clock. So anyone who wants to spend five hours in the bazaar, you have it. And you might need it because those bazaars are pretty large. <laughs> and the economy might need it too, so better do it. <laughs> exactly, it benefits everyone. Yeah. Mehmet, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, this was absolutely incredible. We have so many people now who are hoping to visit Turkey and have learned so much um, if they have an upcoming trip. So everyone else, I hope you enjoyed yourself the way that Mehmet and I did. Uh, we do have several travel talks coming up on the calendar. Um, if you enjoyed this and would like to participate in any future ones, we hope we'll see you again. Uh, you can either sign up online um, to any or all of them. And the website is www.goaheadtours.com webinar. 
Again, Mehmet, thank you so, so much for being here. This was absolutely incredible. I know I personally loved being able to spend this time with you again. Do you have any parting words for the group? Looking forward to meeting you, all of you guys. I agree. Thank you so much, everyone. And we hope to see you all on our grand tour of Turkey soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.